Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here today. We're very excited. Um, my name is Atue Ramos Fermin, and I am the director of programs at the Laundromat Project. And today, we, I'm here to you know, present our first Create Change uh, fellow artist uh, presentations. Uh, these are our 11th uh, graduation. So this is the 11th class of the program. Uh, and it's our first fully virtual fellowship. So we're very excited to be here uh, with this incredible group of artists today that will be sharing more of their work uh, in a bit. And so, you know, just quickly wanted to share, you know, you can learn more about our work on our website, um, and just a quick thing for those uh, of you that may not know us, um, the LP is an arts organization that advances artists and neighbors as change agents in their own communities. Uh, we do this through our Create Change Artists in Residency, which is one part of the Create Change program and our fellowship, which will be our focus for today. And as well as creative community engagement uh, building initiatives in public programs. So, and so, and about Create Change, um, so Create Change is our flagship uh, annual artist development program, including a fellowship and residency, uh, supporting the learning community of artists who are interested, who are invested in developing a, a critical community-based practice via workshops, coaching, guest speakers, peer support, among other ways. You know, we've been doing that for the past six months, um, and we're excited to you know to share this work for you. This is the first time we actually opened this uh, program for uh, members of our community and uh, the, the public at large. So we're very excited uh, for you to connect with the artists directly. I'm here, here directly from each one of them. Um, and, and just before we go on, I wanna just you know, uh, make sure that talk about some uh, engagement notes. Um, so questions and comments go into the chat, uh, probably your thoughts and comments there. And we'll be collecting those and sharing them with the artists. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of time to have a discussion. So there's gonna be a lot of presentations. Um, and, and so, so that you get a heads up about that. Um, there's now a meeting of the general public and then you know, we can block cameras. Um, and so you're able to see the artists and the panelists uh, when they're speaking. And this, so that you know, this is a, a session that is being recorded. And so if you do not wish to be shown, just turn off your cameras and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be uh, sharing it later uh, on our YouTube channel and so forth. Um, there's closed caption available and you just go to the bottom of the screen and you can select the option to see them there. So you know, make sure that you do that if you're, if you're in need of that uh, service. And uh, before going on, I just want to also to do a land acknowledgement. This is something we do uh, for every program. And, and so the London Art Project respectfully acknowledges that we are in Brooklyn the occupied and unceded lands of the Canarsie, who are part of the Monsi Lenape. Uh, we recognize them as the original source of this land and pay respects to their past, the elders past, present, and future. We acknowledge that and offer deep gratitude uh, to this Lenape land that supports us as we gather here right now together. And I invite you to join me in at the acknowledgement, uh, the respect, and that gratitude and showing the same for the land, wherever you might be. Um, and thank you. And so lastly, before we go to me, I just wanted to just a quick note about today. Um, so we'll have uh, reflections this afternoon from our creative community, a celebration for our 2021 Create Change Fellow Artists. So they'll present to have a few minutes to do that. Um, and just a quick you know, grounding this year's six months uh, remote fellowship program was shaped around strategies for understanding power mapping, shifting narratives through art, building trust, accountability alongside community. Um, and you know, we are really you know, invested in encouraging the deepening of uh, community engagement methods across each of the 12 artists' um, creative practices. So they're all from all various, you know, you'll hear from each other, but uh, from them. So you, from all kinds of mediums and practices. Uh, and backgrounds. Um, and yeah, we will hear from them directly today, project design, ideas, and takeaways from their experience with us. 
And today also we're excited to have uh, a host for uh, the afternoon, which is uh, Lauren Argentina Celaya, Director of Public Programs at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and, and I think that's all for now for me. And I will hand it over to our Executive Director, uh, Kemi Alesami, for some remarks uh, for today. So welcome everyone. And thank you for being here. We're very excited and honored to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Kemi Alesami, and I'm the executive director of the Laundromat Project, um, something I've gotten to do for almost nine years. And it brings great joy to my life to be able to share that um, with you. And it means that I get to be in community uh, with all of you. So thank you so much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, first of all, huge congratulations to the Create Change Fellows of 2021. Uh, you are the reason we are here today. Uh, so thank you um, for your grace, your curiosity, your generosity, your creativity, and all the beauty and questions and everything else that you brought to this year. You are our first and hopefully only COVID class. Um, we have not gotten to meet you in person, something I very, very much look forward to doing um, in the future. Um, and that's part of what makes it so incredible that you both decided that part of how you wanted to spend this time was to work on yourself and in community um, by learning, by um, stretching yourself, uh, teaching and stretching others and really dedicating yourself to your art making in the way that you want to show up in community. So the LP, we make art, we build community and we create change. You guys are at the core of what that means to do that. Um, and hopefully um, just from the time I've gotten to spend with you, um, occasionally sitting in on classes and workshops and very much looking forward to your presentations this afternoon, I know that you are grounded and um, overlap with the values of the LP, which is everything from uh, creativity to the sense of abundance you bring to your commitment to history and new histories and um, radical love, right? Um, I actually have a quote that I often turn to, and believe it or not, Gerhard Richter, the painters who said this, but art is the highest form of hope. And um, it is a space to lean into that. And that's radical hope, right? That's not tidy and neat and simple and one dimensional, but hope in all its manifestations and all of its prismatic uh, possibilities for what that can what that can do to lead us to new futures, which is what I hope and I've seen art do in my life and in my communities and what I know that you guys are doing is building new futures. Um, so thank you for being um, grounded in hope and for giving me and so many others hope. And um, this week, of course, was uh, Octavia Butler's birthday earlier this week. And my feed was fed and nourished by so many amazing and beautiful memories of her and quotes of her. And I just am thinking of this, but I got to see her on stage just a few months before she passed. And it's still one of the things that I'm most happy and grateful for that I just happened to decide to go to an event, heard her speak. Um, and a few months later, she was gone. But she continues to be with us and continue, continues to feed us in this moment from a place of hope. And one of the quotes that uh, uh, Didier Sylvain, who's actually um, an LP alum shared on his feed that I took. I had not heard this particular quote, but I want to share it with you because I think it captures the journey that we've been on together and will continue um, as both teachers and learners. And she said, your teachers are all around you. All that you perceive, all that you experience, all that is given to you or taken from you will teach you if you will learn. So I'll read that again. Your teachers are all around you. All that you perceive, all that you experience, all that is given to you or taken from you will teach you if you will learn. 
And um, that was such a gift um, to those words. I hope you receive them uh, uh, as a gift, whether now or in the future. Um, but you have taught us so much, uh, Create Changers 2021 and everyone else in the LP community. I welcome you to the LP community. It's a lifetime community, it's a lifetime commitment. You can't get rid of us now. Um, huge congratulations and so excited to meet you in the future in person for those of you that I have not yet met and to be in community um, as the world um, shifts and begins to open up. So just take a, if we could just take a moment to maybe go off camera even and just do a little clap, clap, a little something, something. Um, reactions is also welcome. I love a reaction button. Um, and now um, I will introduce Lauren Argentina Zalaya, who is our host today. She is the director of public programs at the Brooklyn Museum and always killing it um, at, in that role. Um, very grateful to the work you do, Lauren. As a curator, advocate, and educator, Lauren is committed to collaborating with emerging artists and honoring voices in our communities that are often marginalized. With a particular focus on film and performance and creating programming for and with LGBTQ plus and immigrant communities. She, this afternoon, will guide us through the series of artist presentations, and we are super thrilled and grateful to have her as part of our program in this culminating celebration. So thank you, and I turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Kemi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and congratulations uh, to the class of 2021 Create Change Fellows. Um, we're really excited to hear from you today and hear from your reflections and learnings on the program. Um, as Kemi mentioned, I'm Lauren. I'm also zooming in from Brooklyn, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Delaware people. I'm excited to host the program and guide us through the artist presentations. It's really a gift to participate in this culminating session and learn more about the fellows we'll hear from today. I also just want to take a moment to give gratitude to the entire team at the Laundromat Project and all that you guys do to cultivate artists and cultural producers who are really innovating on the intersections of art and social change. Serious work, so I just wanna give serious appreciation for the LP staff too, including Atwe, Lady Sasha, Tiara, Aisha, and of course, Kemi. Uh, the structure for the artist presentations will go as follows. We'll hear 12 presentations, each around five to seven minutes long. There will be two intermissions after every fourth presentation, so we can take a moment and stretch and breathe, grab a drink. Um, we'll not have a formal Q&A segment, but we encourage you all to interact with one another in the chat box with your questions, reflections, comments, reactions, and more. I'm sure your responses um, and your thoughts will be greatly appreciated. Uh, the LP staff will also collate all of the responses in a mural board as a takeaway for the artist, so don't be shy. Uh, to get us started, our first four artist presentations are by Kenseth Armstead, Manuel Molina Martagón, and Angelique E. Owens and Angela Mystique. The, these four artists all have practices that encompass public works and projects that are participatory and collective in nature. Kenseth is going to kick it off for us this afternoon. So by way of introduction, uh, Kenseth has created provocative conceptual art for three decades. His work, work explores the pivotal explorations of history, American culture, ethnicity, and institution defining moments. In response to the question, what is the role of art and culture for the future of the city? Kenseth responded by stating, we have to expand the role of artists and art in society. We have to become a part of people's lives and meet them where they are. I'm excited to learn more about this perspective in your presentation. Kenseth, please take us away. Hey everybody. It's Ken Seth. Uh, I'm in my studio, which is frequent. And uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Wave if you can hear me. Good. I'm going to show you uh, work that I've been working on now for a little bit. And it's going to be up in a second. Okay. 
So this is work that's in my studio. Uh, I basically want to make the art world bigger and I want there to be public art in communities of color. I have a work up now, it's called Boulevard of African Monarchs. Uh, the partner organization is uh, the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance. And uh, basically this work went up last June during the uh, height of the pandemic. And uh, so it's been out there and uh, it's been communicating with people. There've been conversations on site with me. Uh, a music video was uh, filmed in the work. I haven't been able to do public programming because of the pandemic, but then uh, this uh, music video was done by a queer African pop artist. Uh, the Harlem Wellness Center did a racial healing action with artists. Uh, there's been artist collabs in the artwork and then I'm going to do artist collabs in the work starting this September uh, along with my community partner. Uh, this brings me to the idea of adoption and adaptation. And I feel that all my work has to be adopted by a community and adapted by it. And even though I wasn't able to kick things off the programmings that I planned, uh, as you can see, uh, people did that anyway. So the work was well adopted and adapted and you know, a global audience with a sponsor for World AIDS Day by a queer African pop star is a really great, uh, you know, this, this artist who lived in the neighborhood didn't have to go anywhere else to look uh for a place to shoot a music video about uh queer love anyways what i'm working on now is current is true north feet don't fail me now which is an earthbound version of the work to celebrate uh the underground railroad and i'm trying to build a visual language uh there's uh, if you go to my website you'll see other versions of true north uh one that is uh more of a public monument and this is work that was intended for a commission which I had to design, but then the work continued to grow. So this visual language around the Underground Railroad, uh, you know, 100 million people were abducted from Africa, 30 million survived. And in the last 100 years of the slave trade, after 400 years of the slave trade, uh, 100,000 people escaped over the last 100 years. And I often wonder how many more attempted. So as I show you now, this is the full scope of the work. And most recently, I've been using hot combs to create on the surface marks. And these marks to get somewhere in the area of 200 to 100,000 marks on the surface, which will be achieved. Uh, most recently, this work, I got to show this work has about 5,000 marks on the surface. There are 1,500 marks just on the top of the work. And then I'll show you my, my DJ mixing booth, the hot combs. Once again, this is the whole work. Now this work could be shown outside. Cedar shingles will last hundreds of years outside as a, as a coating material for a house or a roof. Uh, and they're housed in metallic frames that will be added to the tar and wax. It's about halfway there. Uh, did, did everybody see the, the artwork? Wave if you could see the artwork. You saw, good. So, uh, I think I'm probably at about my five minutes and uh, I would love to talk to people about it more. You can go to my website and send me uh, information to contact me, but uh, hopefully this work will be part of work that will be uh, installed somewhere else, but I, I don't have a home for this work right now. Uh, but it's really great to make work to consider how to make language around supporting the Underground Railroad and letting people make a physical relationship and emotional relationship to the bravery of all of the people without education who had to travel hundreds of miles on their own. And with that, I shall conclude and move on to the next artist. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kenseth, for um, showing such a generous look into your work and behind the scenes of the studio. Um, continue to leave your comments in the feedback box or the chat. 
and we're gonna keep track of it all and, and share it with Kenza after the presentations. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Manuel Molina Martagón. Manuel is a multidisciplinary artist working in performance, video, and socially engaged projects. Some of his recent works explore food service and labor. In response to the same question of the future of the city, he believes that, quote, art and culture work somewhere between a compass, a compass, library, mirror, and bulletin board, a place to feel, think, say, and connect. It should really be considered whenever drafting the future of a place. The virtual floor is yours, Manuel. Uh, okay, hello. Yeah, I feel, you can hear me? Yes. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for uh, giving us some of your time and be here to, to, with us to, to share these uh, amazing stories. Uh, first of all, a uh, big uh, thank you for all everybody at the Laundromat Project, Kemi, Hatue, Lady Sasha, uh, all the people that were uh, always there, the, 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 the past fellows, uh, Ebony. Uh, it was an amazing space uh, for a conversation and amazing space to connect. And it was certainly a very nice experience to have this, especially on this weird moment of being kind of like isolated. And it certainly gave me a me a uh, space to to balance a conversation beyond art, even just to like a human human aspect. Um, so I want to show you some of the project I was doing exactly on March eighth, like a week before things like change. And uh, I was hoping to make it this this project uh, keep on doing it as things happen, but then oh, had to like stop. Um, so um, let me. Okay, where are we? There you go. So I thought it was kind of like official slide for the London project, but maybe I was kind of wrong, but uh, okay. So as a great fellow, uh, that's me. I was cooking at the Essex, uh, Essex market on the second floor. They had an amazing kitchen and we were cooking uh, these delicious chiles en nogada. I don't know if you have tried them, but they are really, really good. Uh, it's a, uh, a, a plate that is made from Mexico, from Puebla, the place where I am, and the place where most of the people that are working in restaurants come from. Uh, it's basically a stuffed pepper, uh, that's full of, you know, uh, I mean, it can have meat, it can have pork, it can have beef, it has nuts, it has pine nuts, it has fruit, it has uh, apples, it has uh, apricot. Um, it's all then butter, fried, and then on top, they have this amazing sauce made of goat cheese, uh, walnut, and then topped with pomegranate seeds and some little parsley. I hope you guys uh, have lunch. We, we, we can't see your slides. Do you want me to share? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that'll be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, well, that was me. And then that was the Chile Nogada. And yeah, that was, you know, we were people together. Uh, we would have the chance of making some projects right before, some works right before the, the pandemic started. And it was kind of like a mix of people. We were having, it was made by with the Artists Alliance. And so we were inviting people from the Lower East Side. People came from like even Bright. It was a very open uh, invitation. Uh, things fill up really, really quickly faster than whatever we expected. And yeah, some people came because they wanted a cooking class. Some people were here because they were, they know there was something gonna go beyond the, just making the, the meal. Uh, this this uh, plate is very particular. You can only make it in, in August. Uh, and that's kind of like a big, it's a big uh, meaningful plate that brings, was made to celebrate the first uh, president of, of, of Mexico in, in that sort of sense. Um, it was like an emperor, well, you know, it's kind of a long story, but at the end, uh, it was taken on the thirties as one of the, like, uh, like, uh, uh, emblems of the, like national pride and the, the national story of writing what was to be Mexican, the color of the flag. Uh, and it's a mix of all different cooking techniques, uh, part of all the different, uh, culture that came to Mexico celebration of, you know, like French, uh, uh cuisine, that sort of sense as. Maximiliano and uh, Porfirio Diaz and all this kind of time were like really into this European style and the same the ingredients from you know Mexico and coming all together. Um, so yeah, the idea was to make this plate that is very, very complex that people don't want to do it. It's like you, your mom can only do it or your aunt or it feels like a very special thing. So we did it in like three hours and we did it from scratch. And I think we were making it on the top three of the, the ones that I have ever, ever tasted. And can we go more on, on the slide so people can see what's going on? Uh, so yeah, we were like cooking all together, uh, different ages. We had children, uh, we had some senior people, 
uh, we had um, a mix of, of different people. And the whole idea was you know, to have a space in which food works as a vehicle for conversation. Um, it's, a, it's kind of like a diversion, just to like make people prone to connect in special ways. Um, I feel there was a time um, in which, I mean, it was very personal. Whoever came, whoever had experience, it was all totally different every time. Uh, some things are like a score and some things will happen all the time in a sort of like a, like a play. But a lot of that, you know, whoever comes, whoever, whatever they bring is whatever they, they get. Um, so it was amazing the stories that you get to hear. For example, people that were talking about how food was value in their, in their homes, in a sense of their parents making such an effort to make sure there was always food on the table. Uh, people that were saying that, you know, how their perception of food changed whenever they start working like in a restaurant, because in the house, the, the food was basically, especially, you know, like a, the microwave sort of uh, experience, or you know somebody that was, um, you know, like a Mexican American girl that she got a chance to make this dish, that she had heard about it, but she had never uh, like tried it. That she did with her mom, so it was especially like like bonding, clear moment. For some was like comfort food. For some was people that uh, they haven't you know tasted or tried it in such a long time, and uh, it's kind of all the stories that were kind of happening around the the plate. And for me. I got all these like snippets of conversations. I I'm not there hearing everything because I just don't want that. If somebody you know in a month in a year they somehow have a moment where they connect with whatever was happening, uh, that's what I what I'm looking for. What was very interesting was the conversations that were happening in a sense of like for example, um, how some brands will like hijack recipes, and how they will you know insert themselves into the, this national idea of uh, a brand having uh, like owning a, a dish or a recipe. Or we're talking about how, you know, for example, uh, the deep frying in countries like Japan or India or Indonesia or some other place around, it also had a special uh, connotation, you know, from being like a very like fancy uh, extra thing that the food had to being a part of the contemporary, you know, like street food culture. Um, so yeah, it was very nice to find these kind of like connections with like Philippines, for example, uh, about the, the taste, about all the different flavors. Um, it's very unexpected actually. Um, so I was hoping to make this like every once in a while, probably every month and hope to invite you, but you know, then the pandemic came and then everything stopped. Um, for me, it was very important. This moment was to have this moment of, of pause. I, I never, I mean, the fact of being able to at least do a few of them gave me a sense of, of, uh, you know, peace and hope that after the pandemic, you know, whenever it's possible, uh, I'll be able to like keep on doing this thing because this doesn't goes into like a zoom workshop or it's not something that has to be like done in that in that way uh but certainly it has been a moment for me to think about the places where i need to go deeper into this this project and there are very clear lines for me that i want to expand uh which you know i mean this project was made like like developed for the for the ethics market in that sort of space including thinking about the vendors and the, and the you know local area uh so right now i mean i know what's going to be the next iteration of this but what i'm very interested in is in bringing people together from different generations. Uh, all this knowledge that is being lost, all this knowledge that talks about who you are, who you were, and not necessarily your direct family, you know, but it's a space in which uh, that's, that's, that recipe, that story is part of, of who you are, of who you were, and you want that to exist. Because, I mean, as in, in this very complex year, as we have experienced, uh, people are in and out all the time. And I feel that that's a very important part to to be able to, to remember and uh, especially tap into that um, abundance of stories, abundance of labors and have people to come together and share the relation with the food they eat, about the, what they want to eat, about the accessibility, about the needs. And I mean, for me, the way I have like redefined the way I, I think about food, eat and labor has happened in the last few years. And I just want to wish people can join and be part of more of this uh, conversation. Yeah, let me know if you want to come. I'll happy to invite you for the next ones. And I think that's pretty much it what I have to say. Thanks so much, Manuel. That was a special reflection that not only made me hungry, but gave us a lot to consider about the power and politics of food in community building across age, identity, and nationality. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you much for uh, <laughs> Now we're going to explore the work of Angelique E. Owens. Angelique is a visual artist based in Brooklyn. 
Her practice explores systems and how communities respond to them. For Angelique, the role of art and culture is to shape an equitable and intersectionally just future for our city. We're looking forward to learning more. I turn it over to you, Angelique. Hello. Um, let me share my screen and get started. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see everything? Good. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Timer is start. We're doing five minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the LP because y'all really kept my art practice afloat. I just graduated in August, baby, and it was a hard one. And so I just really wanted to say thank you because um, I think doing community in a digital space is very hard and that was possible. Uh, so coming into this lovely fellowship, I wanted to do an extension of my thesis. So looking into education and systemic injustice and navigating predominantly white spaces as like a black and brown student. And so I was like, yes, like stoop and soapbox culture. We're gonna have students like talking about how they wanna see education. They're gonna speak their piece. People are gonna listen, site activations, the whole nine. And obviously that's not realistic in a panorama. And so I was like, okay, how can I re really think about this concept and make it safe? And so I'm like, okay, education is an exchange of information at like its simplest form. And so I'm like, okay, I would love to create a sound piece. And similar to the game of telephone, really thinking of like, how can I like talk to folks, um, take a portion of that and then play it and have another person engage with that conversation and really just leaving it open. And so a call and response was basically how I was thinking of it and having it exist and activating spaces that used to be places where communal engagement um, historically in bed were also just like currently and just like what that conversation could look like. Um, and so I think one, one of the core things that I learned at LP was just listening um, and the importance of listening. Like I think for me as an artist, like I want to learn, I, I want to create a socially engaged practice. So I want to create respectful and equitable relationships with the community that I'm existing in and knowing that keeping this open-ended. So knowing that through these listening sessions, the idea can change, it can pivot and it for it to be an organic collaboration. Um, and so with that being said, good work takes time. And so I think this was a hard, like a good, like, okay, we want to go about this in a way that's respectful. And so just knowing it's going to take time. So entering into a long form project, I think has been exciting and daunting. And so I've been thinking through these type of questions, um, like what are the historical sites of community within Bed-Stuy? Um, how are folks gathering safely now? Who still can't gather? Um, and just how does this like intergenerational conversation exist? Um, and then what organizations are already fostering community that I can like grow and learn from and um, engage in listening sessions. Um, and so, yeah, respect was huge. Like we learned a lot about like power mapping and that was like blew my brain because I think sometimes I don't realize how people have different social currency. And so that was really interesting. Um, and they also had us think like backwards, like how is this project gonna live after you? Um, who has access to the work. Um, so thinking about online archiving and like how that can happen. Um, and so I think in general, I want people that exist in this project to um, learn different perspectives, even thinking of a type of education that decenters whiteness and also it's like a free form exchange. Um, but also knowing that you're interact, interacting within an ecosystem and there's a responsibility there. Um, and so that these are the things that I've been milling around. Um, and I do still have questions of just like, 
how, how to sustain a long form artwork and knowing that it will exist, it'll have a, a life of its own um, and all, just different ways of to online archive. So if you wanna email me, text me, um, just things that I can learn from, I'm definitely open to that. Um, and yes, I really wanna thank the LP for real for sustaining my art practice because I think um, operating in the art world is really just this delicate dance with capitalism. And so I think that I'm really learning my footing and seeing like real examples of how to exist in both those spaces. And so that's all I got for now. Thank you guys so much. And um, oh my God. Yeah, I think I'm good. Stop share, stop share. You are more than good. Thank you so much, Anjali. Um, so many possibilities of collaboration and educational exchange to consider in this moment. And the questions you raise are super important for those of us who are cultural workers um, to consider in our particular context. So thank you. Remember to leave your comments and questions in the chat box for the artists we have encountered thus far. Next up, we're gonna dive into the practice of Angela Miskis. Angela is an Ecuadorian American visual artist and community organizer based in Southeast Queens. Angela's family upbringing, dedication to social service, and desire to build a healthier and more sustainable future in her community fuel and inspire her work. Take it away, Angela. Hi, everyone. One moment. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Angela Miskis and I am here to uh, present Abuela Neighborhood Maintenance, which is my R slash community cleanup project that I started uh, last year in April 2020. So a little bit about the project. My area of focus is Southeast Queens, specifically the neighborhoods of Queens Village and Hollis, which is where I reside. Uh, the project is inspired by my grandmother or abuela in Spanish. And this is something that she used to do in her neighborhood or in my neighborhood where I grew up back in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And it's a project that I created as a way for me to combine my art practice and also my community work that until this point, I hadn't really figured out how to do. And this is also the project that I developed through the um, Laundromat Fellowship. So one of the questions that they ask is how can art and cultural practice build trust and accountability with communities? And the way this sort of um, presented itself in my work is by first me doing the work and learning how to do it really well before actually translating that work and trying to engage a bigger group of people um, and motivating to to do similar work. Um, the reason why I wanted to increase the outreach of this project is that I quickly realized just the breadth of the littering and illegal dumping that was happening in my neighborhood and pretty much all around New York due to the budget cuts that happened last year. And so I wanted to figure out how I can do this work in community and how I can tap into resources that were available there. So one of the, I guess, techniques that I use is that I contacted an existing organization that was doing similar work in my community. And I just learned, they mentored me to how to work with sanitation, just how to outreach to other businesses and just overall show me the ropes and then eventually I was able to organize and sort of branch out on my own. And I started working with other organizations like parks or the National Park Service. Uh, and these are just some of the pictures from the cleanup events, uh, just the outcome of a beach cleanup that we had a few, few weeks ago. Um, and I just wanted to show these pictures just, um, just that I was so, um, 
I will say, yeah, afraid of like brand, like going into the community, mostly because I am not super extroverted. Um, but I love seeing these pictures here because it just brings me so much joy to know that I was able to put an event where everyone can come together and just share, share the love and their care for their community, which is um, what I wanted to do. Uh, a little bit of how I involve art into the project is by the lettering that's happening on the back of the volunteer's vest. Um, these are all handmade. Um, I make them for the volunteers as a way to show my appreciation and to also set up the intention for the work that we're going to do. And also, so it's very obvious for anyone that is walking around the area that to see what we're what we're doing there. Um, and I also use photography and a combination of different art skills to sort of really tell the story behind why we're doing the work that we're doing. Um, just a quick plug, tomorrow I have a cleanup event. So if you're in Southeast Queens, please sign up and join me. That would be awesome to meet you guys in person. And here's all of my contact information. Uh, where you can follow all of the events and just see how the project will unfold. And that's all I have to share. Thank you. Angela, thank you so much for sharing more about the growth of your project in Queens, and especially your commitment to building community and maintaining and sustaining public space um, in New York. I'm sure we're all excited to learn more and see how it's going to evolve. We have arrived here at our first intermission. So we're going to take a five minute break and I encourage you to just take a moment away from your screens, stretch, grab some water, do whatever you need to do to take care of yourself in the next couple of minutes. And then we're gonna return for the next group of artist presentations at 1250. So we're doing great on time. Enjoy your few minutes and get a stretch and we'll see you soon.
All right, welcome back, welcome back. Everybody ready to jump back in? Okay, I think so, <laughs> sounds good. So welcome back everybody. Uh, the next group of artists we'll hear from are Ella Mahoney, Mariama Jallo, Aileen Zulema Dominguez, and Timothy Prolific Edwajante. These fellows are working across critical modes of storytelling, documentation, and writing with intergenerational community members. First up, we're gonna begin with Ella Mahoney. Ella is an Aquino Wampanoag artist, illustrator, and teacher currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Her work is based on storytelling and draws inspiration from creation stories, as well as from narratives of her personal experience of indigeneity through lenses of love and nature. Her recent projects explore large-scale silk painting and installation as a medium that invites people to play and participate in creating comfortable, loving spaces. On the future of the city, Ella is quoted as saying, quote, I see the role of art and culture in the future of the city as being something to bring people together in joy, to create space where we can listen to the stories of those who have not been acknowledged for so long and unlearn the false narratives built into our society together. Let's learn more about her oral history project. Ella, the virtual floor is yours. Hey everybody, just let me let me get this started. Okay. Okay, so like Lauren said, um, I'm working on an oral history project and calling it Healing Through the Stories, Monsakwi Tamawahi Ni Wanikak. And that means to uh, help me to hold tight to what is good. It's a little part of a sort of prayer in my language. Um, so I started off this project um, a little bit before the Create Change Fellowship started. I was working on a personal project on wellness and going around the community, interviewing and having conversations with people about um, how they relate to water and what it means to them or the legends that they have heard about Aquina, uh, which is my homeland. And I was doing audio and video recordings and then making responses with giant silk paintings. Let's see, oh, that one. And um, so it started out as more of a personal thing. I wanna share a little clip first and then I'll go on. When I was your age and I was windsurfing, he'd always watch me. And maybe I was clamming one day instead of windsurfing, and he said, You gotta go over here in the water because then that's the good spot. You know? And he pointed that spot out. After he passed, I went to that spot. I've never been able to find any cohorts. And all of a sudden, there were so many. There were so many cohorts. And I, I know his spirit is there. And it's just another, you know, that body of water. It meant so much to him to get back to because we, you know, I, I really think that between the land and the water, there's such a connection for our people. So that was my mom. Um, that was the beginning of this project. And I've found a need in the community uh, for a space to hold stories and um, teachings from elders, from uh, all people in the community. Um, there's been, in the last few years, a lot of um, issues with the tribal government, a lot of distrust and a lot less um, cultural building. Um, they've been more focused on building power in a more like, call it colonial way. Um, so people have not wanted to participate with the tribe in any way. So I've, I'm thinking that um, saving our oral histories, saving these stories and getting people involved and having conversations 
um, together and being able to call, have a Zoom call, um, interview people in person that builds relationships. Um, it can help to get people to want to be involved in the community more. And it just, um, I think documenting this is extremely important in saving these stories, um, kind of altering the canon of knowledge of the history of this land that we've come to know. When I um, was. Oops. So this was a, one of the silks I made to respond. This was actually last weekend, um, a little bit of a different oral history project on the Rockaways also involving water that I did. Um, and in the course of the last six months, we've talked a lot about entering and building community um, with community. So I think I came into this project thinking more about myself going and interviewing everyone. And over the last six months, I've talked to many people throughout the community, younger people who have an interest in learning more about uh, what the history of the land, the history of people and being in conversation. Um, and so being in conversation with youth and stakeholders has been really important, um, planning and shaping the work through emergent strategies. So having really casual meetings, going on walks, having dinners and coming up with things or recording each other's conversations there is even important. Um, not having it be such a serious thing. So allowing for various levels of understanding, all ways of knowing and being in creating this story map. Um, I, don't, I don't want this project to be a serious historical archiving project. I want everyone to feel welcome all the time. Um, community outreach has been a little tricky because of the distrust of the tribal government and institutions, but working with uh, existing cultural institutions and stakeholders to create workshops online or find participants or to re reach out to participants of the last projects um, has been really important too. Um, and another thing, um, being in a tribal community and having a lot of traditional knowledge, um, this has come up a lot, who decides what can be shared publicly or privately. Um, I'm now thinking that this needs to have a place to live somewhere online. Um, and I've been in discussion with a few people about uh, finding archiving sites that can be password protected in some spots um, or not if they choose not to, but honoring people's boundaries within this space and making it accessible for um, anyone to maybe upload a story if they want to um, is really important. Oh. And one more thing, I, I, I want this to be, uh, this archiving project to be something that can live on in the community. And I'm, I think it was the Urban Bushwomen workshop that really got me thinking and clicked this into my head that I need to move into, when we're building with community, we need to move into the community with a project that they actually want and need that will last in the community. That is the only way that it will have a life after. Um, and so slowly, slowly, um, I think the next steps are actually finding a place for it to live, uh, talking to more elders and making sure that they are comfortable at, with this being shared or want to uh, have their knowledge shared, written, recorded in video or sound and finding out how to put it all together. Um, yes, that is for me. That's me. And my website, Instagram is more active. <laughs> and thank you, everybody. This has been such a huge uh, part of the last year for me. And I valued being in space with all of you, being in such a comfortable space. It's been so important. Um, the BIPOC community and everything that's been going on. I hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much, Ella. Um, and thank you for your thoughtful engagement around this idea of participation, legacy, and documenting the stories of your community members.
The next project is similar in its focus on recording the stories of others. Mariama Jallo believes that art and culture is vital for the future of the city. Quote, not only will it continue to uplift the voices and narratives of marginalized communities, but it will also serve as a tool that allows New Yorkers to connect and foster community. Secondly, art and culture can also play a role in documenting the stories of these communities. As New York City continues to change, it's really important that these stories and experiences are both honored and properly archived. Mariama is a New York City based storyteller and community cultivator born and raised in the Bronx. We will learn more about her community hub, Jalo Studios. Mariama, I turn over the floor to you. Hi, everyone. I hope you can all see my screen now. Okay, great. So I'm um, very happy to be here today um, to chatting with you all and also want to give a huge shout out to LP for all of these wonderful sessions and workshops that really helped me to really kind of like rethink um, community and how to strategically like integrate community when thinking about like art making. So my presentation will be, um, it has two parts. So I will be presenting on um, Jalo Studios, which was the initial project that I was working on, like when I started the fellowship, but then became very inspired by, you know, projects that, you know, my cohort was also working on and really just thinking about like storytelling and how I personally um, identify with storytelling, especially in relation to um, my identity. So um, Jalo Studios is a community and resource hub for Black women artists and creators who are building creative careers. And overall, our mission is to really just create um, safe spaces where sisterhood is formed. Um, Black women are coming together to, to exchange and share knowledge and, you know, to also um, collaborate with one another. So um, our goal is to once again, create a safe space for collaboration and knowledge sharing, which I think is um, really important. And we, as black women, we do deserve to kind of like have that safe space where we can come together to, um, you know, have that exchange, um, to also cultivate meaningful experiences um, for black women creatives, um, being able to bridge the creative um, gap and also foster communal ties between um, black women. And we do this through web webinars and workshops, um, creative communion and studio sessions. And during the month of April, in honor of National um, Poetry Month, I did kind of like experiment with everything that I had learned and really once again, thinking about how to center community when curating these spaces. And we hosted a series called Healing Words where we kind of like, you know, collaborated with other Black women poets who came on weekly to share, um, you know, their poetry and also talk about how they had kind of like, you know, found healing and freedom, freedom through their writing. And we hosted these on Instagram Live, which, you know, was very accessible to anyone who wanted to kind of like, you know, chime in, um, listen to their work or even like, you know, chat with them and be able to kind of like have that access to ask questions. And it was such a beautiful series and we hosted one poet per week and we wrapped the month up by having a really big workshop where I kind of took a step back and invited two of um, two of my great friends who are um, writers and poets who kind of like came together to design what the workshop would look like. And I think for me, it was really important to do that because I personally don't identify as a writer and as someone who, um, you know, is very um, passionate about creating these spaces. I think once again, that was like an opportunity for me to center my community members, but also tap into my personal network of like artists who I personally admire and know would do an amazing job. And the workshop was amazing. Like the energy was just like indescribable. And when I entered the Zoom session, I saw so many other women who I personally knew and were also a part of my community, but by kind of like taking a step back as like, you know, um, a founder who kind of like does everything all the time and allowing other artists to take charge. Um, it was really interesting to see, you know, who was in the room based on like their personal networks and like how they had, um, you know, how they kind of like personally also connect to their communities, um, if that makes sense. Um, and I think overall in terms of how LP, LP sessions has really helped me to 
kind of like, you know, rethink where I want Jowl Studios to go. Um, once again, really thinking about um, different strategic ways that we can build community. So working alongside um, community members and artists to continue to develop these workshop themes and events. I think it's really important to always kind of, um, you know, be in communication with the people who are attending these workshops because ultimately we want to be able to fulfill um, those needs in terms of what they want to learn and who they want to connect with. And then also really just like continuing to, um, and this was something that I don't feel like I was doing before, but um, continuing to develop and build strong relationships with similar organizations who we can collaborate with um, and also learn from in terms of like, you know, what their approach is. I think that will really help us to really expand our reach and impact, um, which would be amazing. So now we're going to pivot into um, the second project that was birthed throughout, you know, um, the fellowship. And I'm calling it Project X because I don't have a name yet, but this project is going to be a digital archive that uses a combination of visual and or oral storytelling to document the culture and narratives of Guinean Fulani women. And this has been a project that has been sitting like on my heart for a really, really long time, but I just really didn't know how to approach it because I do come from a community where um, a lot of, we don't talk about a lot of things like publicly, like people are taught from a very young age to not disclose a lot about their emotions, experiences and things of that nature. So I also feel like um, the sessions really helped me to think about, you know, how you can still um, archive and create art, but still, um, but, still being able to respect people's boundaries. So thinking about how I can, you know, design metrics or ways where, you know, I can give people the opportunity to share their narrative, but I can also, you know, protect their privacy, uh, protect their identity. I think that is very much possible, especially, you know, in the digital age that we're in. So the goal of this project is to not only archive the stories and experiences of these women, but to also spark a larger conversation within our community regarding intergenerational trauma and healing. Um, challenges and progress. So I think for me, um, once again, thinking about those strategies in terms of like how I can build trust with my community in terms of like, you know, creating a space where they do feel empowered and safe in terms of like sharing these narratives, I think is really important for me to, um, you know, build community trust by showcasing my deep appreciation and affinity to our culture and also being able to use pre-existing photo documentation to teach, connect, and you know, strengthen and form those communal bonds. So last but not least, overall, um, this was a question that I did reflect upon deeply um, in every session that we had. I think it always kind of like, you know, came back and hit the nail on this question, right? How can art and cultural practices build trust and accountability within communities, which I think is really important, especially as like black and brown people. And I think when people have the space and agency to creatively express themselves, their narratives, be able to tell their stories, it can really build strong emotional bonds, you know, within those communities. And I think art and cultural practices really plays a strong role in being able to build community once again, connect generations and just inspire overall civic pride. So thank you so much. And um, for all of you who do want to continue to follow my journey with Jalo Studios, you can follow me on Jalo Studios on Instagram and via our website as well. Thank you so much, Mariama, for such a generous presentation. Your strategies around community engagement uh, for Jalo Studios are certainly going to continue to inspire and make an impact in your community. So thank you. Um, BX is definitely in the building today. Now we're going to hear from Aileen. Aileen Zulema Dominguez is a first generation Chicana Dominicana from the Bronx. She is a poet whose work has long been the stuff of forging community, of affirming belonging, and the first step of the first step toward liberation, of imagining new, better, and more radically loving worlds. In the same vein, she believes that quote. Art is to the city what sun is to the land and its plants, a source of both affirming energy and inspiration. Engaging in art making helps us better know ourselves, and that is the first step to better knowing each other, to nurturing a love-based culture. That was a mic drop. Thank you so much, Aileen. I pass it on to you. 
perfect thank you so much lauren um let me go ahead and share my screen here all right so i hope everyone's doing well like lauren mentioned my name is aileen sulema dominguez um let's see if that works okay can folks see my screen everything cool great okay so yeah like i mentioned uh like was mentioned i am a poet writer youth arts educator and community artist um my po my project title still in flux because i am a poet and because i think no poem or piece of writing is ever done um is for now titled poetry mapping and i wanted to shout out as i will do throughout the presentation as i'm sure many of us do in our practice um, a lot of our foundations a lot of the folks and other artists and predecessors who are doing this work and kind of laying the groundwork for us to jump off of um, and the first is amanda everich who is an artist educator collaborator who is engaged in radical map making and they really um, kind of laid the groundwork for me and, and affirmed the notion that there are ecosystems of wisdom all around us and that each person is a map um, and they use that process as a storytelling tool and as a tool of decolonization um, I often say that we are all living poems each person is a living poem so poetry mapping and this project is kind of a combination of those ideas. So poetry to the streets. As mentioned, it's a project born firstly of community asset mapping, which was one of the major learnings and tools I took away from LP, I think. Um, and sorry, my screen um, of storytelling and of youth arts education and engagement. So at the base, what the the project is about is getting South Bronx students' words out from the classroom, from the notebooks, from their minds, and just out into the streets that they know and love and walk every day. Um, it's a project really rooted in wanting to provide Black, Native, Latina youth a sense of permanence in a, a landscape that is so rapidly changing. There's so much gentrification in the South Bronx unfortunately so much displacement, um, especially for a lot of first generation students and their families who I work with. And so I really wanted them to have a space where they can articulate those feelings, where they can also affirm what their homes mean to them. And my community, the community I'm working with, um, is very hyper-local. It is South Bronx. Um, it is a lot of black and brown students by nature of that geography and of that community. Um, and another major takeaway from LP this session was that the hyper-local, um, which is what the pandemic, I think, kind of turned us in towards, is really beautiful and powerful and important. And that's something I try to carry throughout the entire project in my practice now. So some kind of guiding values and goals that I've been couched in throughout this is first and foremost affirmation, which is how I really entered into poetry and writing and art. Um, it was looking for a sense of my story mattering, of my story belonging, that I really entered into the arts community. And I wanted to affirm all of these students' experiences. I'm constantly telling them that they are poetry, that their mother's accent is a poem, that their father's cooking is a poem, that their sister's laugh is a poem, that every little aspect and detail of their supposedly kind of commonplace lives really do matter and are beautiful. Um, and I want that as I want that to serve as a stepping stone for them to figure out how they can pursue liberation, how they can pursue community change and belonging, etc. Um, and kind of in tandem with affirmation is the valuing of their stories and giving them room to grow their storytelling potential and capacity. Um, I was really struck, I think, I know Kemi was talking about Octavia Butler's birthday recently, um, I have so many of her quotes just constantly in my mind, but the notion that teachers are all around us, not only am I a teacher to them, but I try to instill in them that they are teachers themselves, that their parents, their ancestors, abuelas, etc., all have very valuable lessons in their stories. Um, and to kind of get that down and onto paper and pursuing a sense of futurity, especially in a very rapidly gentrifying South Bronx. I really want them to see their words out in public, out in the 
quote unquote real world um, and in places where they don't often see their words. I think I turn also towards James Baldwin um, and many quotes in, uh, in many writings when he speaks of how we can't fully enter into or critique or begin to change society without first knowing as best we can and to the greatest extent we can ourselves. And so this is really what that's couched in. And he also gives us the notion that home is perhaps not a place, but an irrevocable condition. And I wanted to build off that and I pull from that to say home to me and in this project is kind of a constant process and choice and action. Um, and I wanted to give the students this tool to build home even when it is changing all around them. So that was kind of the theory, the guiding values, goals. Um, the gist of it, if it's not clear yet, is that I will just be printing out and tagging up Bronx walls with these students' poems. Um, and in doing that, I really hope to just advance the students as change agents, as their very own storytellers and torchbearers. They are carrying all the wisdoms they carry, all the beautiful little mundane aspects of their lives into the future, um, even as time is constantly changing around us. Um, and I wanted to turn back to the core of it. So mapping has a lot of definitions. Uh, the more formal ones that are in dictionaries are dealing with recording, with spatial distribution, with associating elements of one group with another, etc. So I see this, the posting up of the students' poems throughout the Bronx as a sort of remapping. Um, we are re and or newly associating different stories with parts of the hood. We're telling what matters most to them. Um, yeah. And some of the methods, as I mentioned, I really sat and made sure I did my best to do community asset mapping to see what is it that the community already has. And the Bronx has so much, but the piece that I work with the most is all of these beautiful, poetic, naturally poetic and storytelling black and brown youth who don't often get a chance to express themselves and write these things down. Um, and I always ask them to really delve into the senses of what community and home feels like to them, to be able to have a list or a bank to then pull from um, and tell their stories from. And the way in which I kind of entered and am trying my best to build with community is seeing every action as an offering. I thank LP and the Create Change Fellowship so much because I don't really have a formal arts training for better or for worse. Um, and so I just couch myself in the fact that I, I know and I hold dearly that I am artful and poetic by nature. And I reach out to these arts organizations who are doing the work in the South Bronx and try to engage with them and show them my offerings and have thankfully been able to connect that way um, and teach students that way. And I've also connected with some organizations in the community who are doing anti-displacement work, who are organizing around it, such as Mott Haven families. And I'm trying to get them to provide resources to the students as well and to their families. And so just forging these connections and making sure that they last long after I'm no longer doing the project, et cetera, um, which is another takeaway that I really thank Ebony Noel Golden for. Um, and as for what's next, the poems, for those who have not walked through the Bronx yet or are not around the Bronx, the poems are not up yet, but they will very soon be. Um, I'm working with Yuka Arts, who are in the South Bronx, to actually print them up. I'm hoping to include QR codes, um, which was another takeaway from a mentoring session in LP, so that there could be a virtual map and a kind of virtual home with audio recordings of the poems from the students themselves, just to have some more accessibility, um, to really let the poet tell the audience member who passes by this poster, these words, what that place means to them. Um, and also what's next is always kind of tending to watering, perhaps repotting the community organization connections that I have. And as a little wrap up, as I'm wrapping up, I wanted to share this one poem from my student. Her name is Mallory Casada. She is super proud of it and 
was so glad I was sharing it. Um, I'll read it very quickly, but this is an example of a time I asked them to personify the Bronx and to really live it and say what that means to them. So I'll be brief, but Mallory starts. I'm the Bronx, where kids love to play, play games, play names, play till they make it rain. I'm the Bronx, where music is alive. It jumps up to dunk on the basketball court and skips hopscotch in the playground. I'm the Bronx, where teens hang out, either looking for clout or for the right dirt to sprout. I'm the Bronx, where viejitas love to talk chisme, gossip so we know what's up. I'm the Bronx, where people help each other, hold the bus door open, help you get up and in. I'm the Bronx, and I hope I never change. And I was just so moved by Mallory's piece and by her ending, um, and I'm so excited to post up all of these students' work throughout the Bronx and continue working with them. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much. I don't have a website or anything, but if folks want to keep in touch, it's my IG, my socials. Um, and thank you all so much, and thank you to LP. Wow, every action is certainly an offering. Thank you so much, Aileen, for sharing those words with us all. And thank you for your, your work, especially in centering the voices of young people. I think we could all use more of that. I'm excited that we're gonna continue forward with another poet in the cohort. Timothy, or prolific, is a poet, writer, educator, genealogist, designer, healer, and organizer who synthesizes ancestral traditions, creative practice, and hip hop culture as an Afro-Indigenous folkloric praxis. Pro believes that, quote, art and culture are a vital part of how we as human beings live. It is the expression of our imaginations through creative practice that allow us to feel, empathize, imagine, heal, and liberate. The future of art and culture in the city is equity rooted in Afro-Indigenous liberation, which would free us all. Thank you so much, and on to you, Pro. Peace, everyone, and greetings. Um, I hope that you are all well. Um, I am grateful to the LP, um, to my ancestors and the ancestors, everyone present um, and within this cohort for providing support um, and love and grace throughout this entire process. Um, if there's one thing that I learned so far within this experience of the fellowship, um, it's something from one of my coaching sessions with Ebony Noel Golden, which was to slow down. Like I was ready to jump into community asset mapping, local activations, marketing plans, but I was reminded that I'm a servant of the word first. And the work that I'm doing involves a level of excavation and storytelling and ritual that I need to be able to come up with all of the roles and the manners in which myself, my ancestors and my immediate community are going to be involved before doing the further mapping. Um, so I'm going to share with you a presentation that I have. Um, one thing I had to, one thing I have to note, and I'd be remiss to not note, is that this work is my life's work. This work is something I'll be engaged in for the next decade of my life. And as I think about community asset mapping here in Bedford Stuyvesant, where I live, I also will have to do the same process um, in on the North Shore of Long Island, on the South Shore of Long Island, in Eastern Long Island, in Virginia, in Barbados, in Grenada, in Panama because this project is massive in terms of its scope. And I'm looking at how, how I can continue to revitalize and revisit aspects of this process um, and who I need to build with as I enter um, and exit and maintain uh, connections to various communities. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, as y'all heard, my name is Tim. I do a lot of stuff. And part of the process that I had was to be really clear about what entity I'm doing this work through because the work is larger than myself. Um, the work is rooted in genealogy. It is rooted in creativity and performance. And it's also heavily rooted within ritual. Um, the name of the company that I run, which is a publishing and multidisciplinary artist collaborative is Owofro Adobe, which is an Akan phrase that means the snake that climbs around the Ruffia tree. It is from an Adinkra symbol that you see that is in the background of a logo. And during the time um, of this fellowship, I developed not only this logo, but the values and the mission statement and the vision statements that are associated with it, that are the root of my practice. Um, I also did some visual identity work because I teach graphic design. My students had to do the same thing. So I wanted to make sure that I was able to do that as well. But onto the main course. 
um, which is a gungun or Las Muertes Hablan or the Dead Speak. Um, it is a multidisciplinary creative ritual rooted in the Adenkara concepts of Sankofa, Nayamidua, and Owofra Adobe. Um, Son Sankofa, um, some of you may be familiar with, is the idea of honoring the past to inform the present and determine the future. Nayami Dua, which is the Adinkra symbol that you see here, is a tree or a place of communal worship. Um, the photo in the background is one that I took at the Mitinakak Mass Burial Ground in Douglaston and Queens. Um, I'm a descendant of the Mitinakak peoples and I had gone there to do some ritual um, and to just begin to build that relationship with the ancestors who are interred there. And they are pivotal in terms of being able to understand this work. Um, and lastly, Owofra Adobe, which I've already explained. Um, the focus of this iteration of Egungun is to utilize genealogical and genetic research as a catalyst for healing and creative expression in the pursuit of rep reparations for Afro-Indigenous peoples. And what I can say in terms of that is I really believe that knowing our histories, knowing our ancestors in a way that is intimate and knowing our communal ancestors. When I speak about ancestors, it is not only this um, ethereal concept of the people who came before, but it is the people within our bloodline and the people who are from the place where we currently reside or where our families reside and building those relationships. And I believe that being able to know and honor that will be able to help heal um, cycles of intergenerational trauma, but also to be able to provide us with the basis for personal reparations. And by that, I mean being able to name the people and places and companies that were complicit in the harming of our ancestors and our families and our communities and to be able to hold them accountable in whichever way we determine is necessary. Reparations can look like many things, whether it is monetary, whether it is conceptual, although I do think that it needs to be material. Um, we built too much wealth for this place in these places. Um, and the scope of this is international because the crimes and atrocities committed against our peoples um, were international in their scope. Um, this photo was taken at the Puspatuk Reservation um, where my cousins live and you know, that's, that's a sacred space where the waters meet out east. Um, some of this work was birthed there as well. The work that I am creating will include video projection, audio design, live performances by a yet to be determined and probably rotating cast. Um, there will be altars and sacred spaces in each of the locations because they will be site specific. Um, sometimes in a community on a street corner or it could be at a space such as Weeksville Heritage Center where I've done genealogy workshops for the past few years. Um, various burial grounds, um, cemeteries, and ancestral lands. Um, the future communities that will be included will be my childhood communities of Uniondale and Hempstead, um, parts of Port Washington, where I'm part of one of the oldest Black families from that community, um, New Bern and Stella, North Carolina, Richmond and Charles City, Virginia, Worthing, Barbados, Grenada, and Panama. Um, beginning here in bed -Stuy, I've been focusing on doing the community mapping. However, I was also contacted by my former high school um, which is seated on, which exists on the unceded lands of the Batinacock people uh, of my ancestors. And we're talking about doing truth and reconciliation work as they are a uh, really well-known, high-performing college preparatory Quaker institution. And they were co-founded by a group of people that enslaved and massacred some of my ancestors to have the land that they currently occupy. So as I continue to look forward in this work, I'm thinking about well, what rituals need to take place with what groups of people and with what communities on land. Um, in the doctor's hours with Sharifa Rhodes Pitts, one of the things that really struck me from that conversation was the nature of archival work and historical work, that sometimes you just need to stand in the intersection or stand in the land and let the history hit you. And I've become really clear that as beautiful as my apartment is in my communities that I cannot do the remainder of the work indoors. Um, it is summer, it is time to be outside and to put my feet on the dirt, um, to put my feet on the earth and to allow for the opportunities for those stories to be able to come through and to archive those as they are excavated by myself and others. Um, lastly, there are community activations I've been a part of throughout this fellowship. Um, I'm grateful to Ebony Noel Golden for um, pulling me into the Freedom Fellowship um, during the first week of being at the LP. And, uh, for bed -Stuy Strong, who asked me to lead a grief ritual um, for victims of, of COVID um, and of police brutality um, back in March. And then my dear friend, Andre Zachary, had me um, be a part of Drexia Redo and Afrofuturist Cabaret in May, where I put together work that honored ancestry um, in relationship to this idea of resistance. 
Um, yeah, and I, I think that we are we are at time. So I'm really grateful to all of you. If you are interested in learning more about what I'm doing, I'm gonna put a link to this presentation where if you wanna check out any of the videos or materials that are here and to sit with any of it, you can find it there. Um, I'm located everywhere. If you search Timothy and Prolific, you got me, but I'm also at Pro Jones, uh, my former last name, 22, um, on everything. Um, shout out to mom and dad, because I know they're in the audience and to my Blackout family. Um, peace to all of you. Thank you again to the LP for supporting this work and for your generosity and time. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, thank you for your vision toward healing and reparations across geography. That was a, a powerful way for us to close out this second grouping of presentations and lead us into the second intermission. So I know that we're running a little bit over time. So this time around, we're just going to take a three minute break and return at 1.33 uh, for a final group of presentations. So do what you need to do to care for yourself and we'll see you back in three minutes. Hi, my name is Gabriel Torres. I am a Colombian theater artist and a storyteller. I am currently living in New York and my practice focuses on community, education, and new ways of telling stories. With the Landuma project, I am working on House of Dust using theater, a game, and a garden to bring awareness about substance use in Latinx queer communities. As someone who struggles with substance use, I know vulnerability, connection, and honesty can help us heal. And storytelling can do exactly that, create pathways for communication. Okay, we are back. Hope everyone got a moment to hydrate and reconnect. Welcome back, welcome back. We will explore our final group of artist presentations uh, with Raven Ruffin, Iram Sudaf, Kimberly Tate, and Sam are Ridiculous Akrush. These fellows have projects that focus on community building, resource sharing, public campaigns, and peer learning. We're gonna kick it off with Raven. No. Raven is, hi. <laughs> Did somebody just say something? Sorry. <laughs> no mean. problem, I'll, I'll continue on. <laughs> hi Raven. Raven is a community arts organizer and digital placemaker for communities of color. She organizes community programs and develops digital strategies to center communities of color and for the support of contemporary artists of color. She's also the founder and community manager at Brown Art Inc., a nomadic incubator to promote the growth of local art ecosystems and better opportunities for artists of color. On the city, she shared that, quote, art and culture are the breath of the city and black, brown, indigenous and immigrant communities sustain their vitality. Take it away, Raven. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Lauren, for that introduction. Uh, as it's been said, my name is Raven Ruffin. Uh, before I get started, I just want to extend a, a deep, deep sense of gratitude to LP, 
to the entire team there, to their network of practitioners, artists, coaches, Ebony out there. Um, you all have just poured so much love and care into our work. And so I just so much appreciate this time and being able to share with everyone out in the audience. And then I also just wanna say thank you to my fellow fellows. Um, Y'all are just amazing. I've just enjoyed learning from you all, growing with you all, um, and just the way we've held each other through this whole process has been so amazing. So thank you to everybody here. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I share the right one. Can you see something that says Brown Art Inc.? Yes. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so I have some notes in front of me so I don't get sidetracked. Uh, but yeah, again, my name is Raven Ruffin. I am one half of Brown Art Inc., a nomadic arts incubator. And just to give you a sense of who we are, I'm just scrolling through our website, brownartinc.com. Um, and I will plug that again later for you all to learn more. Uh, but to give you a sense of what we do, Brown Art Inc. is a nomadic community incubator to support the arts ecosystem for artists, cultural practitioners, and communities of color. Our work is firmly rooted in community and place as site of memory and cultural geography. And so that's just to give you a sense of what we're about. Uh, and you can see our bios here. My collaborator, Amanda Figueroa, my co-founder, we founded Brown Art Inc. in 2018 after working together in the blog space, creating a platform, um, but realizing we wanted to do more for artists, artists of color in these spaces um, to provide them resources and help them sustain um, their work. Uh, we work at the intersection of art, geography, community, and history. Uh, we have deeply <laughs> academic backgrounds, for better or for worse, um, in these areas. And so that's where we are coming from as two women of color who've had to leave our communities um, to pursue education um, and do this work away from them as we are constantly bringing them into those spaces with us. Um, you'll also notice that our work is deeply citational. Um, and so that's something very important to us as we think about the communities we enter, uh, the spaces uh, that we enter into thinking about um, who our, our foremothers, our forefathers, et cetera, are in this work that we do. We're always citing them in, in the language that we use and in the practices uh, that we employ. And so that's really important in how we are building our practice around supporting artists and institutions. Uh, so moving through our work, um, our mission is largely, like I said, around supporting artists of color um, at a number of levels. Uh, the way that our, our work is thinking through space and place, we recognize that the current ecosystem does not support artists in their communities. Uh, so many of us are not unfamiliar with the way that artists and art workers have to leave their communities for large art markets. And it makes it um, almost impossible to, to support your practice. Uh, especially when it's a, about your community in the community uh, that you're in. And so really trying to support artists in displacement, anti-displacement, anti-gentrification practices, um, and being able to create sustainable ways for them to be in community uh, with institutions, whether that be programming, uh, to invite them to uh, activate their practices in museums, libraries, uh, cultural institutions, et cetera, or again, creating a capacity for the community to even understand that they live among these artists. And so that's been our work for the last few years um, to really help in this perpetuation and cycle of gentrification that happens so that artists can support themselves. And that's looked like the work that I was giving examples around supporting them in creating relationships to institutions, but also a project that we entered into with Launching Art Project is called Women in Residence. And so this project is an oral history archival project. It is currently live with our first artist, uh, but the impetus for this project is really thinking about the ways that women of color, artists, and as art workers are doing uh, this invisible labor, right, of keeping the arts ecosystem going as curators, as archivists, um, and as artists themselves, and the ways that we are deeply, deeply undervalued and underrecognized in these spaces. And I mean, we also know this is a larger problem just among artists of color in general, right, the way in which, um, you know, it takes several decades for us to be recognized. And, where we are, we're in our 70s and 80s um, or posthumous uh, in the ways that we get recognized uh, for our practices or the ways that we um, 
really crafted spaces for art and creative practices. And so Women in Residence is really thinking about the ways that women of color take up space in these um, institutions, um, in these practices to really push the future of what art can look like. And so what we're doing is capturing oral histories of Black, uh, Indigenous women of color to really just capture their practice in this moment so that we don't have to wait until they're 80 to find out what they were thinking in their early 20s or 30s and 40s around their artistic practice, how their work was informed. Um, a question that I say that we're often combating in our work at Brown Art Inc. is, I can do that, right? And so oftentimes people go to the museum or they, they go to an art gallery and what makes this work special? How do we connect our communities to this work? And so much of that is just demystifying who the artist even is and creating relationships. And so for us really wanting to build a narrative around the ways that artists are not just putting stuff out in the world, right? But that it's very deeply informed by research, that they are in community with other artists and art workers uh, to, to think about this work, collaborating with each other. And so Women in Residence is really thinking about these networks of collaborations, these networks of invisible labor that are there that don't often get talked about. And then from there, building onto these oral histories curriculums that can be used to insert these, these uh, women identified folks into the canon, the art, the art historical narrative and canon earlier in their careers rather than waiting, right? And so I just really wanna thank the Laundromat Project for giving me space and time to think about this project more deeply. Uh, Pre-Panini Press, uh, we were ready to go. We were going to jump right in uh, into, you know, creating programming, doing what we know how to do best. But I think during this time and also having Laundromat Project uh, to think alongside, realizing uh, that we needed time to really be doulas in this work and think alongside of our communities. And so, as I mentioned, we are academics uh, and how we enter this work. And so oftentimes that can be really insular. And so being reminded of the ways that community really does exist at every step, if we wanna make this a tool um, that feels good for them to use and feels valuable. And we don't wanna just create this just to be creating it, but really seeing this as a tool that can sustain artists. And something I didn't mention that I wanna say is that we're also paying artists at every step of the way. We're paying them for the oral history, paying them for their artifacts that go into our archive. We're also paying them uh, for any curriculum and uh, any assets that get created out of this archive. So seeing this as a way for an artist, a woman of color artist, to be able to build her career over time um, and sustain her work while also creating a kind of community around their work. Um, so again, just thank you so much because I think we were definitely on a kind of train tracks of We've been doing this for so long, let's just keep moving. Whereas we did need that moment to really stop, rest, um, and, and re, re pivot, I'll say, um, to think about uh, what it looks like to do this work in its essence and in its core at the community level. And so um, our first artist, I'll just tap into this as I close out um, for Women in Residence, um, is Sadeh McConan. Uh, let me move these out the way. And if you're familiar, she's an Ethiopian American artist in DC, based in DC. And so she is our first artist that we have live on archive. If you want to check that out, you can go to brownartinc.com or womeninresidence.com to see and hear her story. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to now revisit and think about the ways that we can take this work back to DC, um, build around her communities, build around the community of performance artists that are in DC and help them sustain their practice uh, without having to relocate um, to find success, quote unquote, um, in their practice. So thank you all again. Thanks, Raven. We're excited to hear more about what's to come with Brow Art Inc. and your multiple projects. Sadaf is up next. Sadaf is a South Asian American Brooklyn-based creative coach and curator. She is the founder of Alpha Arts Alliance, a hyper-local collective and global agency that serves artists of color of all ages. For her, quote, art is the future of a community-based education. The role of the art, the artist is increasingly as a teacher and mentor. The world is shifting rapidly and we have a duty to prepare our youth with the skills and mindset to succeed. Excited to learn more. Over to you, Sadaf. Hey everyone, thank you. So it's been really nice to hear what everyone has been working on. Um, and I wanted to start off just by giving a teacher shout out because I know we have teachers here in the cohort and also in the audience. So whether that's as a classroom teacher, a mentor, a tutor, 
so much love and praise to you. Um, teaching is the noblest profession, in my opinion, and also the hardest. Teaching is definitely the hardest thing I ever did and is the basis of my project and the practice I'm going to share with you today. So um, I started off in the school system in 2011, and this is uh, during my time as a dean. Um, this is also about when I started to step into my own identity as an artist. It took me a long time to do that. Art is not encouraged in, in my household growing up. And what I started to see is that the moments that my students felt the most free um, were the moments they had the least of, so the creative outlets. So for example, um, when I started out, we had recess once a week on Fridays for 15 minutes. If you got detention, you did not get to go to your extracurricular activity. And sometimes that was up to 30% of our school population. So I did what I could um, within that system. I started an art club. I ran our Friday school assemblies. Um, but in my role, what I found is that the students who were being sent to um, out of class the most often and to my office were the artists. They just hadn't been taught that yet. They hadn't been taught to think of themselves in that way yet. And so I made the next hardest decision of my life, um, which was to leave the classroom and start um, alpha and that's still shaping exactly what that is, but a core part of our pledge is that artists contribute a percentage of their sales from commissions to fund our youth programming. Or they contribute directly through skills or by leading the programs so um, over the last year since the pandemic we've led three different youth programs and i'm going to spotlight the one for this year. Um, Last year, we had uh, the Drawing Exchange, which was in collaboration with Columbia MFA. Um, we had a community arts and gardening program with our local community garden. And then this year, we had Photography Now. So this is a little snippet from, um, from the course. So why photography? I thought about this question of the role art has in shifting narratives, and I think especially in the last year and a half, we've seen the role photography and documentation has in truth telling and in social justice. Um, but for our youth, their interactions with media is often through social media. And so along with a few creatives, we decided, well, let's give them some tools and skills and resources and see how that might shift the way they are thinking of their surroundings, but also the ways they can tell their stories. So. These two artists, Rashid and Elena, um, they had never taught before and I worked with them to develop their first syllabus and curriculum. And the students, here's a little snapshot and we do have their permission um, to, sh to show their images. So just giving that, that preface. So we met on virtually on Zoom um, and then also had in-studio time and fun little tidbit. Um, once upon a time, all these students were shorter than me I'm five foot two, so I've gotten to see them grow up, but now they're getting ready to go on a high school and college. And today, uh, you are actually the first people getting to see their projects, which are launching publicly tomorrow, along with a print sale. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what you think about that, and I know the kids are too. One of the main focuses on in this program is how do we present photography as a creative outlet, a form of artistic expression, but also as a professional pathway, as a potential career. Um, I know in our cohort, we had plenty of self-taught artists, and that means that you taught yourself not only the, the artistic skills, but also how to navigate the field. And that's something that our schools, many schools, I won't say all of them, are not introducing to our youth early enough. So it really, it takes a village and here's just spotlighting um, one of the ways that I, we were able to gather support from guest speakers like Mark Clennon and John Henry to mentors who came in and worked with the kids in the studio um, or on our community walk. So here's a little snippets from our photo walk. You might recognize Fulton Street, Kingston Throop, um, some of our mentors here as well, who really stepped up. I think in the last year, we've I've seen a lot more artists with a desire, expressing a desire to connect with youth. Um, I think we're thinking about the ways, the things we wish we had had, you know. So some of the partnerships and resources we were able to gather 
Elena, Rashid, and I had to be very realistic about our strengths and our weaknesses. What could we provide and what did we need? Um, we were able to partner with Photodom that provided us uh, film, film processing, um, and, a, and gave us a tour. Breaking Bread NYC, some of you might be familiar with, that provides uh, vegan, uh, healthy options and, and education around nutrition. And then Prolific Studios, which offered us uh, studio time. And so before I present the projects to you, I wanna ask a question to the group. In your opinion, and you can drop this in the chat, um, what is the hardest thing to teach? What do you think is the hardest thing to teach someone? I'm gonna exit out so I can see your responses. Taxes, to trust themselves, to confidence. Like, yes, exactly. Vulnerability, critical thinking, balance, recovering self-sovereignty. I'm definitely patience and trust. Definitely still working on that. How much they already know. So it's, Exactly. And I think all of these things really tie together when it comes to teaching motivation. Oh, so sorry. When it comes to teaching motivation, confidence, vulnerability, all those things tie together. And so one of the most challenging parts of this program was knowing when to step away and release that responsibility. For me, it was we're stepping away from the instructors and for the instructors stepping away from the students and seeing what they created. And they they really came up with some magic. So we are launching this tomorrow publicly and I'm gonna drop the, um, I'll drop that link in, the, in our email list, but also in the chat if you wanna check it out. So every student developed a project and we'll also have a select uh, one or two prints for sale. And that's how they also get to see the way that we are promoting and sharing their work. Um, so I'll give a few samples. This is Mikwa Ferrer. If you've been at Dance Africa over the last few years, you might have even gotten to see her perform. Um, she created a project called Family Seams. So her dad is a designer. And she took us into his home studio behind the scenes, creating some of his apparel. Back in the day, he even designed apparel for Wu-Tang Clan. Um, so she's definitely grown up in a creative home. And then she stepped out and took us into her social life. Um, with her friends and her cousins, had them model in some of their favorite parts of Brooklyn. And so this is a student who had never touched a camera before outside of her phone. And she did everything from the concept to the editing to the layout that you see here. And she's 17 years old. This is Sean. He's 14. And he did a project walking through Brooklyn Bridge Park during golden hour with his mentor and his cousin. This is Court Shadows. And a woman with the birds. And this is Ava. She has a project called Crowned. Her mother uh, is a makeup, her aunt is a makeup artist and she's seen the way that those clients get transformed and she wanted to capture that same confidence in uh, and natural beauty alongside the glamour. And she's 14. And finally, Zakari is my literal next door neighbor. He was our youngest apprentice and he is very self-sufficient, um, has to take care of a lot it, that has him, you know, kind of going on walks alone um, into the community. And so he presents the adventure of walk. So we are going live tomorrow and you can follow along on our um, Instagram. I also drop the website. And if you ha see any project that particularly calls to you or you wanna communicate that feedback or a note to the student, um, definitely feel free to reach out to me. We're encouraging folks to kind of give their input and for the students to uh, have a dialogue in that way. Um, you know, one of the lingering questions I had, and I had a session uh, with LP earlier this season, thinking about this is when we think about teaching motivation, um, 
you know, matching folks as potential mentors and then allowing that to grow organically um, is something I'm thinking about. How do we create lasting mentorship? You know, you can introduce the pieces, but what role do we play in facilitating versus that release of responsibility? Um, and just much thanks, because I know many of you, uh, you know, we live in the same community, and so it really takes a village. And just knowing that how many of you are out here doing similar work um, feels like we're kind of all chipping away together, makes it feel surmountable. So thank you, LP, and thank you to the cohort. And I look forward to hearing from you and what you think of the, the project. Thank you for the reflection on your educational practice and, and for nurturing the creativity of young people. Sada. We have two more fellows to hear from. So thank you so much for continuing to kick it with us this afternoon. Uh, next up is Kimberly Galaxy Tate. Kimberly is a Filipinx multidisciplinary embodied truth seeker living on the unceded lands of the Napé and Canarse people. She explores installation and architecture as choreographic tools for guided somatic movement experiments with her project, Dance Detecture. We will learn more about Dance Detecture in her presentation now. The floor is yours, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking it out. <laughs> um, thank you for this. Um, season and the container of being together, growing together, um, have to echo so much of what has said already. Um, so, uh, so much affirmation in the group, um, so much uh, also to grow, continue to grow together into. Um, so yeah, I just wanna honor and acknowledge that um, there's a lot to say and I'm not going to be able to share everything. Um, and I, I hope to stay connected to everyone here. Um, and yeah, you can hit me up on Instagram uh, or email me or find me in the neighborhood. Um, so I live in Flatbush, Brooklyn, by the way. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Present. So, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I um, entered to the, the fellowship with this project um, called Mother Earth Mending Care Circle. I'm a new mother. My son Apollo is just 17 months. Um, he came out before the pandemic and it's been an interesting year of rebirthing myself and my family as, um, as I'm also, you know, living and being with my son and, uh, and his daddy, um, building family together. And as I am doing it, so many <laughs> of my peers are doing it too. So many creative artists that I have worked with in the past. Um, so we are, you know, birthing our village and next generation. Um, we are depleted. <laughs> we are isolated. Um, many of us don't have our families nearby. So um, it's an issue of, you know, societal structure. <laughs> Um, and I believe that for our children, for the for a more resilient future, we need um, we deserve also our own healing um, connection and self actualization. Um, so my values that are driving my my work right now are really about this hyper local, the ecological, and this village crafting. Um, one thing that was affirmed for me with the LP um, workshops and the, and the teachings in this, like the participatory action research that, that, that um, we must be implicated in the work. And so the community here starts with, starts with me and starts with people I'm already in relationship with. 
um, you know, that it's important that we must include ourselves in this work. And this hyperlocal is like, it's somatic, it's relational, it's intimate. Um, so that's, yeah, that's really, particularly I believe for folks in the diaspora, black indigenous POC, that, you know, self as source, self care is ecological care. Um, self recovery is ecological recovery. So um, this remapping of power to restore personal power and sense of self um, is at the core of my work right now. Um, and, and living into abundance, recognizing that we do have everything we need, um, leaning into our interdependence, um, we have everything we need together. Um, so this project um, now, as we come together into the public, it's, it's, I've been holding it in many different ways and um, it's, it's evolving, of course. Um, what, so as I said, I live in Flatbush, um, Prospect Lefferts Gardens, Brooklyn, this is District 40. Um, and there are so many uh, new families of creative parents. Um, and we do, again, have a lot of assets. <laughs> um, cultural assets, uh, our ancestors, uh, our spirit, love. Um, and uh, what I'm stepping into as we are stitching village, um, not in a formal way, but it's kind of, it goes through these informal um, within building relationships through play dates, through our music and dance class, um, through, through sitting together, um, sister circles, um, together physically and, um, and online. Uh, what I started doing this month um, on Sunday nights, and I invite any, any uh, women, femme identifying um, matriarch, uh, you know, whether you have a child or not, you hold this um, role for your community. We need, uh, we need rest and regeneration. So Sundays um, at the end of, you know, the end of your projects before the next week, um, I'm offering these um, self-care sessions with somatic meditation, gentle movement, restorative, um, restorative practices. Um, this other project that is really central to what I do is this, uh, this dance texture I mentioned in my introduction. Um, I'm an architect by training, and yes, I have a, a strong movement practice, and it's at the intersection of both. I build these labyrinths for movement ex experiments, and um, so I'm interested in now as we are coming back to space and public space together, back to our life in public, um, and holding these, or offering this, um, these labyrinths uh, for reintegration of lessons that we're learning, that we've learned from the pandemic um, in our, you know, in our private, uh, as we were isolated and separated, all that process of you know, bringing that into the public. Um, so I know that the city, of the city and lots of people want to have conversations about the designs of public space and as they relate to um, mental health and wellness or structural oppression, climate resilience, environmental justice. Um, this is a project um, I would like to have embodied conversations um, to, to, to explore these issues together in community. So um, this is about remapping power and engaging our bodies in the conversations and engaging our um, lived experiences. Um, and um, yeah, and, it, and I, this is like an, also a, a, a prayerful, ritualistic, uh, playful way. Um, this is a, a plaza in my neighborhood, Parkside Plaza off the queue. Um, this is a, a, a plaza that I'm interested in activating. Um, and 
so with this public art activation, with these embodied conversations, and um, the, the, the vision is that this would lead to some community-driven design workshops. I teach design at Parsons the New School and with the Center for Architecture, um, K through 12 and adults. And I'm interested in taking, taking these, um, this knowledge sharing um, to support folks in, um, in articulating their visions, um, learning more about language, like architecture and design language and process, um, uh, visualizing them, communicating them out and bridging to um, professional design professionals and city agencies who are also interested in this work. Um, um, and um, yeah, let's see, let me return. Oh. Did I share my screen? Is it, sh how do I? I am um, trying to return back. Anyway, I may not have um, shared my screen. Um, <laughs> I'll share, yeah, I will share the slides another time. Um, gratitude again to the LP and um, make space for, for, uh, for Samer. Thank you, Kimberly. Dance of Texture is definitely gonna be an innovative, off innovative offering for us in thinking around the building the future of our city. Um, it's about time for the grand finale. Again, thank you so much everyone for holding space for all these incredible artists um, as we dream together today. Um, we're going to wrap up our afternoon with um, a presentation of a project that proposes actions towards solidarity. Samer Ridiculous Akrush is a self-taught New York-based Jordanian-American multidisciplinary artist working in painting, sculpture, performance, and video. His work is shaped around the themes of identity, duality, and bridging the gap between Western and Arab culture. He shared that quote, the role of art and culture for the future of our city is being a catalyst for joy by uniting the people of all backgrounds through accessibility, love, and creativity. Please take us away, Samer. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming in on this Saturday. It's been a long work week, and I'm going to nap after this. But um, where do I want to start? So I uh, went into the laundromat project with a specific idea. I wanted to bring um, Arab Delhi owners uh, and intersect them with the people of the community, try to get them to understand each other better. How do we bring the people closer together? And so my idea was that I wanted to paint locals that are well known that I see every day and post them, replace the Coca-Cola signs um, on the windows and things with people from the community. So if you're walking by, you see it. Oh my gosh, I see myself. And um, everybody would have a conversation and talk and it was great. And I'm still doing this project, but um, in recent, um, I don't wanna say recent times cause it's been ongoing for a while now. Um, I wanna say the escalation of um, Zionist violence on Palestinians made me feel like I had a call to action to step up and do something. Um, I just want to, should I start off with slides? Yeah, I'm gonna start off with a couple of slides. Um, let me just share my screen real quick. Um, and I guess for emphasis, I just wanna say that um, I first wanna start off with saying free Palestine I condemn all Israeli actions of military violence, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, terror on these people, and it's horrible. And um, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share my screen so we can get, am I sharing it? I think it's, it's going, okay. So I'm just gonna share some um, quotes by people that I look up to in the liberation movement. Uh, I'll first start off with Nelson Mandela. He says, we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. And just an FYI, Nelson Mandela was on the US terror watch list until 2008. Just 
So, you know, don't judge your moral compass by what the, whatever this country says. Always, always, you know. Um, I'm gonna give a quote by Angela Davis. This appalling treatment of undocumented uh, undocumented immigrants in the US and the UK compels us to make connections to Palestinians who have been transformed into immigrants against their will, indeed into undocumented immigrants on their own ancestral lands. I repeat, on their own land. Um, and the next slide is uh, Black Panthers and the Palestinian delegation at the first Pan-African um, uh, Cultural Festival in Algiers. Um, and this was in July, 1969. And this is Malcolm X with the early leaders of the Palestinian Liberation um, Organization in 1964. Malcolm was a staunch uh, critic of Zionism as a political philosophy. And this is the Black Panther Party leader Huey Newton with Palestinians. Um, and uh, he's uh, meeting with Yasser Arafat here. He says, we support the Palestinians just struggle for liberation 100%. We'll go on doing this and we would like for all progressive people to join our ranks in order to make the world in which we, um, in which all people can live. And the last slide is by um, Toni Morrison. Um, she signed in that, this was, I believe in 1993, she signed a, uh, letter with 17 other artists, uh, a solidarity statement. Um, and in the statement, she says the subsequent, um, argument accusations and vows all serve as a distraction in order to divert the world attention from a long-term military, economic, and geographic practice whose political aim is nothing less than the liquidation of the Palestinian nation. Um, so I'm going to move on to the video so basically um last minute project change i decided to go out into the community um and honestly this is that shout out to noel because i, I don't want to go off on a tangent but but laundromat project taught me the importance of language and how powerful it is and for the longest time i've been saying oh people are getting killed people are getting killed no it's ethnic cleansing and um along with the with with the, the power of language you can unfortunately you can get lazy you can just use words like safe spaces and marginalized P and poc and just sit back and put your legs up but no like i i there needs to be actual active change and shout out to noel for for instilling that um throughout the past six months um i'm gonna play this i know there's a thing where um the sound how am i going to be certain that the sound let me know if you guys hear it in the comments so i decided to go around harlem hanging posters in solidarity with palestine although many businesses refused afraid of what people might say there were a lot of establishments that wanted to uh, fight for the cause and raise palestinian voices up I went to many local delis in my neighborhood on Malcolm X Boulevard, Adam Clayton Powell. A lot of these delis were Arab owned and were more than happy to fight for the cause. However, like many other people of color, self-censorship is real. And the possibility of losing customers made them shy away from speaking up. This process made me realize the importance of intersectionality. The Palestinian liberation movement is not singular, but is tied to all universal decolonized movements from around the world. This decolonial fight is also an abolitionist fight. There is no liberation for all without Palestinian liberation. We cannot be silent or complicit. It is not a conflict, nor is it complicated. It is ethnic cleansing, violence, military terror, genocide, colonial expansion, dispossession, and apartheid by the settler colonial state of Israel. Short story time, from 1980 to 1993, the Israeli government prohibited Palestinian artists from using the colors of the Palestinian flag in their artwork. As a form of resistance, they painted watermelons, and I did the same. This video serves as a call to action to go out into your neighborhoods and speak up for what you think is right. All right, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, I just want to, uh, real quick, just uh, say thank you to the Laundromat Project. Hi, everyone. Hello. This uh, video that we're doing right now. Oh, I'm sorry, another YouTube start. video played, and I was like, who is <laughs> I'm sorry, it just went on to the next YouTube video. Um, 
So no, I just wanted to say thank you to the Laundromat Project. Um, before coming into this, well, number one, let's first start off. When I applied to Laundromat Project, there was never an option for Middle Eastern North African on the thing. And that was the first time I've ever seen it. So shout out to, to leading the movement, leading the progression. And um, also I didn't realize, I thought I was proud in who I am and my identity. I didn't realize how, how, how much I was censoring myself. Um, I, uh, shout out to uh, Atwe. Um, we were looking over like my portfolio to apply for school, for grad school. And I wasn't trying to include any of like my Arab Middle Eastern looking portraits or anything like that. And he told me, he was like, I think you have a problem with, the, with censorship. You shouldn't be like trying to put the Western things forward or whatever. And it started off with that. So by the time I, you know, everything was happening in May at the height of the, the, the Palestinian struggle, I was like, I think I need to say something. And thank you for giving me the platform to say this because honestly, a, a lot of people can't, can't talk like this. I can't talk like this if I was anywhere else. I mean, even something as simple as where's my kafir? Well, it's too late to grab it, but um, I can't even wear that. It, it's become a symbol of terror. Speaking up for, for, for justice is, is I mean, the way how media is, is manipulating the language, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. It sucks that we're gonna have to look years from now and realize like what atrocities we did by, by staying complicit. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much, it's been a long day, uh, but thank you so much, Laundromat Project. I love you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. Um, Samer, thank you so much for your energy and for stepping up to close us out with your creative commitment to justice for Palestine. What a dynamic and thought provoking project. Everybody here has really um, done such expansive and thoughtful work. We have reached the end of our road together. I wanna to extend my gratitude again to all the artists for sharing such incredibly thoughtful, um, generous, celebratory bodies of work. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and strategies with all of us and for being so transparent about your process. It really helps us as cultural workers, I'll speak for myself, to, to do our work better too, so thank you. Um, I'm now gonna pass the mic on to our laundromat supporter, Catherine Almonte, uh, a friend of mine and former colleague as well, who I'm really excited to introduce. Kat is the Global Head of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement at Sotheby's. Take us away, Kat. Hey there, thank you so much, Lauren. It's great to see um, so many familiar faces today. Um, so Lauren said, my name is Kat Albonte. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a member of the LP community and the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion and Community Engagement at Sotheby's. I am also the LP's Catalyst Circle co-chair along Salome Asaga. Um, the Catalyst Circle is a membership program that includes change makers, creatives, and Create Change alumni. And we all deeply believe in the power uh, of art to create change. Um, myself as an immigrant, a, long life, a lifelong New Yorker and a Black Latina, art has so often allowed me to see the world both as it is, but also as it could be. Uh, it's really been an honor to get a peek into your work today and more importantly, your lived experiences and those of your communities. Uh, it, it's so important and so impactful, all, all of the work that you are all doing. Um, Honestly, over the last two hours, I learned a lot. I laughed. Um, I even te teared up at some point. I had to, uh, you know, take a take a moment and step away. Um, I've just felt so many emotions, and and it's because of all the work that you are all doing. So you should all be so grateful and so thankful, um, and so proud of yourselves for for what you're doing. So the, the LP really has a special place um, in my heart. It, and it's days like today that remind me why I'm so in love with the people and the work of the LP. Um, so thank you so much for creating this beautiful space and this beautiful program. It's been a privilege to be in community with all of you on this Saturday afternoon. I hope today has brought you joy uh, and has highlighted the crucial role art plays in human connection. So on behalf of the 70 Catalyst Circle members, many of whom are here today, uh, I would like to congratulate the 2021 Create Change cohort uh, and thank all of you for being here. Thank you for that uh, amazing uh, statement. Thank you, uh, Kat. Um, and so I want to thank, you know, again, I'm a three times a director of programs at the LP. I will a little bit of the time, but I just want to close with some thank yous. Um, as you know, it takes a village. You know, it's not 
you know, just one person or not. It's just a lot of folks behind this work. And, you know, I want to thank Lawrence Laya for hosting today. I want to thank, uh, just a quick shout out to Risa Wilson, our founder, which she was here earlier uh, with the vision uh, and that's here planted, you know, the work and, you know, so grateful for her uh, and for showing up. And also want to shout out to Ebony Noel Golden, uh, our incredible partner for uh, all, now more than 10 years, uh, cultural organizing consultant and strategist and amazing, you know, coach uh, for the fellows. And we're so grateful to have you in our community. So thank you, Ebony. Uh, Urban Bush Women, uh, which has been also instrumental in the work. And shout out to the doctors for Doctors Hours. You know, a lot, some of you are here, so I want to thank you all. Uh, and our incredible team, uh, Lady Sasha Jones, our artist engagement manager, Tara Austin, Sibel uh, Sikotenka, Erica Rollis, Whitney Greer, uh, and the rest of the team. Really, really uh, amazing work. And thank you uh, for your uh, dedication. And, and finally, I want to just you know, thank you, thank your funders, of course, and the artists. Without you, we wouldn't be here. So I want to be uh, so grateful to all the Great Change uh, Fellows 2021 cohort. Uh, it's been an incredible journey, and uh, we are still connected. So uh, more, more, more about their work. Uh, we'll follow up with some thank yous as well. But thank you so much, and have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>